welcome to Shankar's daily news analysis. Shankar AS Academy is going to conduct a prelims test series known as pre-storming which consists of almost 48 tests. You can enroll in this test series by clicking the link given below in the description. So today's topic of discussion is these three articles which we are taken from the Hindu, Indian Express and Live Mint. In this first article, we will discuss about the ethanol blending program in India and what are the challenges with respect to that. We will also discuss what are the goals fixed by India to achieve in the ethanol blending program. And second, we have the new Lady Justice. We will see what are the significant changes which are made to the Lady Justice statue in the Supreme Court of India. And lastly, we have the marital rape. In this article discussion, we will see detailly about the marital rape and what are the important judgments with respect to the marital rape in the global level. Without further delay, let's get into today's discussion. So, take a look at this image of the new Lady Justice statue which is located at this Library of Supreme Court of India. You would have seen this image all over the social media yesterday. They have made some significant changes to the statue of Lady Justice of India. Previous traditional image of the Lady Justice statue of India and here is the new one. Take a pause and try to identify the significant changes which has been done to the statue of the Lady Justice of India. First one is the blindfold. They have removed the blindfold which symbolizes that the justice must be perceptive and it should not be blind to the context. This implies that everybody has to be treated equally. And next you can see the sword is replaced with the constitution of India. Usually the sword is associated with the force and now it is replaced with the constitution of India. This emphasizes that the justice is rooted deeply in the law and democratic values and not by the violence. And third you can see the changes in the attire which is replaced with the sari. This is also reflecting a move towards integration of cultural symbolism to the statue. So now we will compare the features of the old lady justice statue and the new lady justice statue. So here is the image of the old lady justice statue. So previously there was a blindfold that signified that there will be impartiality and objectivity which is it is based on facts and not biased. So, this will ensure the justice without the pre-justice, without the prejudice. And next, it is the SWAT. The SWAT symbolizes the authority, enforcement and the decisive nature of the justice. And thirdly, we have the scales. So, the scales represent the balance and fairness in weighing the evidence. And lastly, we have an western utter here. So, this is depicting the Greco-Roman style which is reflecting the European origin of the statue. So, this traditional Lady Justice statue is originating from an ancient Greek and Rome. So, it reflects the European symbolism. So, in contrast, the new statue of Lady Justice has gone some significant changes. Let us see one by one. First is there is no blindfold here in this statue. So, this represents the receptor perceptive justice which means it can see and understand the complexities of the cases without any bias. And second we have the traditional Indian attire here instead of the western attire. As the statue is dressed in the Indian garments it is symbolizing a cultural shift from the western to the Indian symbolism. And thirdly as already said the sword is replaced with the constitution. By holding the constitution it is symbolizing that the justice is based on the law, fairness and democracy rather than the sword which is representing the force. So, in this image you can see there is a retainment of scale in the statue symbolizing the balance and impartiality in delivering the justice will be maintained forward. So, these are the comparison and contrast between the features of the Lady Justice statue of the Supreme Court. And now we will see what are the debates around the changes in the statue. As you can see in the image, it is the Lady Justice statue and not the Men Justice statue. The critics argue that while the statue is symbolizing the women empowerment, it should be equally accompanied by the actual representation of women in the judicial positions. So, he is underlining the less representation of women in the judicial positions. This is the first debate regarding the changes which is done to the statue. 
and second we have the cultural symbolism as already seen there is a change from the western attire to the indian attire some view this as a positive step towards modernizing india's judicial image but others see this as a superficial gesture and third uh, talking about the historical context so some discussions are revolving around how the statue is going to fit the india's broader historical narrative of the law and the justice so this leads to the questioning whether it is truly reflecting the values of the contemporary world talking about the public acceptance the perception of the public is completely varying some are supporting it as a progressive symbol but others are criticizing whether it is necessary or a replacement added to this there are concerns about there, whether there are political motivations behind the statues installation there is a rising question whether it serves as a genuine commitment to the justice or it is just a tool for a political messaging so these are the debates revolving around the changes which has been made to the lady justice the statue of the supreme court now we will see some legal representations with respect to this article first is the rule of law it is nothing but law is the supreme authority and this statue says that the principle that law must be equally applicable to all the individuals regardless of their status this is the primary representation of this statue we mentioned that there is a scale in the statue so this scale is going to represent the need for the fairness as well as balance in the legal proceedings so this scale represents that the pleadings of both the cases are heard properly the statue is also serving as a reminder that all individuals are subjected to same amount of legal standards and protection thus the statue ensures the equality before the law so we know the sword is replaced with the constitution and this book often symbolizes that the laws and the legal text are the main basis for the decisions which are taken in the judiciary so in this article discussion we saw what are the changes which has been made to the new lady justice statue and secondly we saw what are the debates revolving around this and lastly we completed with the legal representation of the statue with this knowledge in mind let's see a prelims practice question so the question is the statue of lady justice is a common symbol to legal system worldwide which of the following statement accurately describes the symbolic elements typically associated with the lady justice so we have to find whether the particular symbol is representing their meaning so here the first statement is the blindfold represents the impartiality and objective application of the justice yes the first statement is correct and the scale symbolizes the balance of individual rights against the power of the state and the second statement is also correct thirdly we have a statement the sword signifies the shift in the and sometimes punitive nature of the justice yes this statement is also correct and fourth we have the book under her leg represents the unwritten customs of law and justice yes all the statements in this question are correct and the correct answer will be d all of the above so with this we'll conclude the discussion on this article and now let's move on to the next one take a look at this newspaper article this article regarding the ethanol blending program is in the newspaper live mint let me give the crux of the news article first so you know that india has introduced a program called as the ethanol blending program before getting into the details let me explain the crux so this program has helped the india sugar industries because this program has helped the excess sugar production to make the ethanol which is a biofuel so by deviating the excess sugar production to make the ethanol it is helping the farmers and it is also helping to stabilize the sugar industries as a whole so this program has also contributed to the india's energy security because by blending the ethanol with the gasoline we are reducing our de dependency on the fuel imports it has also helped us to cut the carbon emissions and support the farmers of crops like maize through the better price discovery and this ethanol blending program is also a key role in achieving the net zero emission by 2070 let's see how first ethanol is nothing but a biofuel which is obtained from the sugar cane and other cereals so by fermentation of the sugar cane we are going to get the biofuel ethanol and by blending this ethanol with the gasoline such as petrol we are going to use it as a 
fuel for the vehicles. So, this ethanol is a renewable source and it is a more cleaner fuel compared to the gasoline. By this way, it is going to reduce the air pollution as well. For example, if you see a E10 vehicle, it is nothing but we are going to blend 10 percentage of ethanol with the 90 percentage of gasoline such as petrol. So, this is the basics of the ethanol blending. It is nothing but we are going to blend the ethanol with the petrol. So, as already said, ethanol is mainly produced from the sugar cane. So, let us take a quick view that where are the sugar cane produced majorly in India. So, talking about the subtropical region, it is widely produced in the Uttar Pradesh, Bihar, Haryana, Punjab belt. While talking about the tropical region, it is majorly produced in the Karnataka, Tamil Nadu, Maharashtra. So, this is why Uttar Pradesh, which is the major producer of the sugar cane, is called as the sugar bowl of India. So, now we will try to understand what are the basics about the ethanol blending program from the prelims perspective. The main objective of this program is to reduce the reliance on the imported crude oil. As we are going to blend the ethanol with the petrol, we are going to reduce the dependency on the oil import. This is the first objective of this program. Next, we are going to promote the use of renewable energy source. That is, ethanol is a renewable energy source. We are going to promote the usage of this ethanol. And third, we have the objective to support the farmers by using the excess sugarcane. As already said, we are going to divert the excess sugarcane production, production to produce the ethanol. This is the three main objective of this program. So, this program is launched in the year 2003, but after the 2014, it got significant improvement in this program. We have achieved 15 percent ethanol blending by the last September 2023 and now we have the target of achieving 20 percent ethanol blending by the year 2025. Please make note of the year. So, what will be the source of producing the ethanol? First is the sugar cane. As already said, we are going to ferment the sugar cane juice and molasses to produce the ethanol by the process called as fermentation and distillation. We can also produce ethanol from maize, other damaged grains and surplus grains. So, what are the benefits of this ethanol blending program? First is the energy security. By using ethanol as an additive to the gasoline, we are going to reduce the dependency on the crude oil import. So, this has saved almost 1 trillion dollar since the 2014. Talking about the environmental impact, ethanol is a more cleaner fuel compared to the petrol. So, we are going to reduce the carbon dioxide emission by transforming to the ethanol blending. So, in economic impact, we are going to create an alternate market for the excess sugar which is produced by the farmers. So, this will benefit the farmers significantly and it will also stabilize the sugar cane industry. So, in what way it is going to support the farmers? The farmers can discover better prices for their crops like maize and this will create an additional income sources for the farmers. These are the benefits of the ethanol blending program and the ethanol production by the Indian farmers. So, now we will see what are the challenges with respect to this program. First is the feedstock availability. So, the main source for production of this ethanol is the sugar cane and this sugar cane is very water intensive crop and it is subjected to many climate risks. So, the ethanol which is primarily produced from sugar cane is subjected to several challenges because the availability of these feedstock is uncertain as these crops are susceptible to the climate variability. Because of this dependence, it can also create supply fluctuations and it will also create a difficulty to meet the increasing demand of the ethanol. So, we have to ensure the food security of the sugar cane to produce the ethanol. Second challenge is the infrastructure and the logistic challenge. So, we have a goal to attain 20 percentage ethanol blending by the year 2025, but it seems that we do not have a existing better infrastructure to achieve this goal because many ethanol plants are located very distant from the oil marketing company. So, this is leading to higher transportation cost and logistic challenges. And the third challenge is the technological and the capacity constraints. As already said, government has made significant steps towards this program since the 2014 rapidly. But many plants are not adopting the advanced technologies to improve the yield and efficiency. Added to this, the sugar industry is also facing limitations in terms of the capacity, especially when they have to scale the production 
to meet the future targets. And lastly, we have a challenge the, that is the policy and the pricing issues. Usually, there is a complexity in the pricing mechanism for the ethanol procurement. The government will decide the price for ethanol which is derived from the sugar-based sources. But the other feedstock-based ethanol such as the maize are determined by the oil marketing company. And this can lead to the disparity in the prices and profit which is gained through the ethanol production. So, these are the five important challenges with respect to the ethanol blending program in India. Now, we will see what are the main goals of this ethanol blending program. First goal is to achieve the 20 percentage ethanol blending by 2025, which is nothing but they are going to blend 20 percentage of ethanol with the 80 percentage of gasoline. And second, we have a goal to contribute to the net zero emission by the 2070. This can be done by adopting to the sustainable biofuel usage. And lastly, we have a goal to expand the ethanol production capacity in India. So, this will help us to reduce the import of oil and also to improve the income of the farmers. So, this is the basics of the ethanol blending program which you have to understand. And now let us see a prelims practice question. Which of the following crops besides the sugar can is used for the ethanol production in India? So, the correct answer will be maize. C. So, C maize is the correct answer. With this, let us conclude the discussion on this article and now let us move on to the next one. Take a look at this news article regarding the marital rape which has been in the news for the past few days continuously. So, let me discuss the crux of the news article first. So, this article mainly discusses about the legal challenges with respect to the India's marital rate exception. This article mainly focuses on the origin of a doctrine called as the doctrine of coverture, which we will see consequently what it is. And it is also discussing the current scrutiny which is conducted by the three judge Supreme Court bench. So, this article is also highlighting the conflicting judicial opinion. One, they are saying this marital rape exception is almost patriarchal and unconstitutional in nature. But the other side is saying that this marital rape exception is very important for the marital stability in India. So, this debate is going on and now we will see what is the marital rape and what are the legal recognition and debate revolving around it. We will also see some important judgment with respect to the marital rape across the globe which we can quote it in our answer sheets. So, marital rape is nothing but it is a sexual act without their consent. So, the marital rape refers to the non-consensual sexual intercourse between the partners. So, in this marital rape, one partner, typically the husband, will force the other partner to engage in the sexual act without the consent. So, this is called as the marital rape. While the rape is usually recognized as the crime, the marital rape has been historically excluded from the legal definition of rape almost in many countries. So, the main idea of not criminalizing this marital rape roots to the doctrine of coverture, which is nothing but when a woman is married, her legal identity will be covered or almost merged with the husband. It means that she will lose the rights of herself and the husband will take control over her property and earnings. This is called as the doctrine of coverture. And this marital rape having deep roots with this doctrine. On the whole, marital rape is nothing but a sexual intercourse without the consent of the partner in the marital relationship. Now, we will see the legal recognition with respect to the marital rape and the debates revolving around it. First is the global variation. Many countries including the most western nations are criminalizing the marital rape now. They say that recognizing the marriage does not nullify the need for the consent of the partner for a sexual relationship. For example, the USA criminalized the marital rape in the year 1993. This is the global variation because in USA they have criminalized the marital rape but in other countries like India, they continue to exempt the spouses from the rape charges. This means that even when there is a forced sex in the marriage, it is not recognized as the crime in the India. This is the global variation that they are talking about. Next is the arguments regarding the criminalization. Those who are supporting the marital rape exception 
often argue that regulating the sex within the marriage is unnecessary. They also fear that the laws which are criminalizing the marital rape may lead to the false accusations destabilizing the marital relationship in India because marriage is considered sacred in the Indian culture. So, these are the arguments against the criminalization. They are fearing that this may lead to the accusations and the destabilization of the relationship. Now, we will see what are the arguments for that is supporting the criminalization. They say that the marriage does not imply that there is a permanent consent offered by the opposite partner. And they say that the forced sex in any context is a violation of the human dignity and the freedom of their body. So, this party which is supporting the criminalization of the marital rape are emphasizing the fact that if we are not going to recognize the marital rape, it can lead to the inequality and will also allow for the domestic abuse within the household of India. So, this is the two party which is supporting the criminalization of marital rape because it is affecting the dignity of the individual and again we have the parties which are going to support against the criminalization which are considered about the acquisition and the spoiling of relationship in the marriage of India. So, now we will see some important judgments which have taken place all over the India with respect to the marital rape. Let us start with the India first. So, in 2022, the Delhi High Court delivered a split verdict. Justice Rajiv said that the marital rape exception is unconstitutional as it is violating the women's right to the bodily autonomy and the dignity. This is the verdict of the Justice Rajiv. But Justice Harishankar said that he uphold the exception of the marital rape. He stated that the marital rape laws could have a destabilizing effect on the families and marriages. This is the verdict in India. Now, we will see what is the verdict in other countries. For example, let us take United Kingdom. So, they said that the husband is not entitled to force his wife into sex because marriage does not imply there is a permanent consent offered by the opposite partner. And this case in the year 1991 marked the end of marital rape exemption in the United Kingdom country. Talking about the judgment in the Canada, the court emphasized that the consent is very important in all the sexual relationship, including the marriage. Talking about the judgment in the South Africa country, here the court upheld that the criminalization of the marital rape by saying that the husband has no automatic sexual rights over his wife and there is a requirement of consent is essential in all the relationship. And lastly, we have a case in Nigeria in the year 2016. In this case, the court ruled that a marital rape is not a crime under the Nigerian law. So, here we can see they are sticking to the traditional view that the marriage is implying directly uh, automatic consent to the sex. So, here you can see a diversity in the judgments which are given by different countries. Now, we will see a prelims practice question. Consider the following nations, USA, United Kingdom, Sweden, Philippines. How many of the above countries have criminalized the marital rape? So, the correct answer will be all the above. All these four countries have criminalized the marital rape. You can quote it as an example if this question is asked in the mains. So, with this, we will conclude the discussion on this article. We have come to end of today's video. If you found the video informative, do hit like, give your feedback, search comment and don't forget to subscribe. Thank you. Have a nice day.